How's it going? Let's talk about writing a fantasy series. This is the third video in what is becoming a series on writing a fantasy series. Today I want to focus on world building and I have three specific examples from this series right here, the Stolen Kingdom series that I want to bring to you because I actually have done a video on world building before right here and that was an awesome video with tips but I feel like if you're anything like me sometimes we need to learn from actually seeing something done versus just hearing how it's done and so I want to actually bring you three specific examples of how I built the world in this series or this series whichever one you want to go with these are the paperback covers and these are the hard cover covers <laughs> in case anybody's curious um, I have three videos on the covers in this series I will link them below if you're curious but yeah options the first video that I did on what I was learning about writing a fantasy series was before any of these were published and then the second one was oh gosh I think it was somewhere shortly after this one had come out and so it's been a while I've picked up some cool things but I'm especially excited to share today because today is the one year anniversary of publishing the stolen kingdom yeah it's a cool day I didn't really ever picture this day honestly I couldn't really see past publishing so <laughs> it's a very cool feeling I'm excited about it all right so I got my notebook here I've got tons of notes my first example is these are all going to be where you pull inspiration from but the first place that I pull a lot of inspiration from is actually from images specifically Pinterest so I have a Pinterest board which I'll pop on the screen I'll show you kind of how I organize how I try to look up different things like rooms and landscapes and different outfits and different expressions that people wear and different just everything I try to get a really wide variety because I know personally that sometimes I like to pull you know one aspect of a photo and then another aspect of another photo and I like to combine and pick and choose what works for me specifically I have found this to be especially valuable when creating places and rooms and like landscapes that you've never seen before and you obviously if especially if you're in a fantasy series and you're making it up completely it's something that can feel very is it one dimensional or two dimensional i don't know but it just doesn't feel real the whole 3d it doesn't feel like you've got a good grasp of it sometimes and that can come through in your writing and i figured this out when i started working with beta readers which was that when i had a scene where i had looked at a picture and i had gotten a really solid image in my head or a bunch of pictures and i'd kind of merged them together if i was describing something i had actually seen it came across very lifelike and real to my beta readers but when I hadn't done that they typically would say I can't really picture this I'm not sure where we are what's going on and so I found that me being able to picture it helps my readers be able to picture it and they can also help you come up with something that you wouldn't have thought of yourself so for example these floating castles on my Pinterest board gave me the idea for the land of gin which is going to be a very unique place uh, with these floating did I say castles I meant islands floating islands they have castles on them in the pictures but there's just so many beautiful images and so this inspired the cover for the original book four cover so keep this in mind because I'm very excited for you to see that but let's keep going to the next one the second place that I get inspiration from is actually from I want to call this a couple things so I'm struggling with how to name this but I'm gonna say from other stories because this can cover both made-up stories and history because history is huge to actually pull from our past from the world's past from different circumstances from different events from different what else do I have on the list here <laughs> from different cultures from again other stories whether that means TV or movies or books but other things that are out there now I know that this is gonna bother some people so I got this quote from this notebook and I ripped it out so don't mind me but I will put it on the screen in a second it says nothing is original steal from anywhere that resonates with inspiration or fuels your imagination devour old films new films music books paintings photographs poems dreams random conversations architecture bridges street signs trees clouds bodies of water light and shadows select only things to steal from that speak directly to your soul if you do this your work and theft will be authentic authenticity is invaluable originality is non-existent and don't bother concealing your thievery celebrate it if you feel like it in any case always remember what I'm gonna mess this up what Jean-Luc 
Godard said, it's not where you take things from, it's where you take them to. There are a few other quotes about this on Pinterest that I have saved in the past just to remind me and other writers who I've talked to that there is nothing original anymore, but when you can pull things from multiple places and put your own spin on them, they become original and authentic. An easy example of this is of course retelling. So if you are doing a retelling, you are naturally telling another story, but you're putting your own spin on it. So Aladdin retelling, Little Mermaid retelling, Beauty and the Beast retelling. <laughs> Another great example is this book. So the Hunger Games series, this author has talked about how she was watching TV late at night and I think it was a game show and something about, I might be butchering this, this is just what I'm remembering, but it's been a long time. So she was flipping back and forth between these two channels, between this very light, happy thing and this very dark, sad situation. And in her mind, she started picturing them merging together and she created something that is totally unique out of two things that were actually in the real world. So that is a perfect example as well of pulling inspiration from other stories and from history. In my first series ever, which is Evelyn's number and Pearl's number, I had a world based on a lot of things that I pulled from North Korea and from um, Hitler, actually, from researching what was it like to have kind of a socialist, I think it's socialist, communist, um, words, uh, I'm ruining this. But yeah, just a society where there's a dictator who won people over and convince them that this horrible, awful way to live was a great idea. That book would be an example of blending um, world politics and religion and seeing like that mashup that came out of that. And then last but not least, in The Stolen Kingdom, I wanted to share how I actually created some cultures based on real human world cultures. In the Stolen Kingdom series, I was working on trying to make very distinct cultures because I wanted there to be the humans, and then I wanted there to be the mer, which are the mermaids, and mermen, <laughs> and then I wanted to have the jinn. So I wanted these to be very distinct cultures, and I didn't want them to line up with um, the typical medieval fantasy that we see because while I love that and I love reading that it's nothing wrong with it But I feel like it's been done a lot And so I wanted to do something new and different So the first thing that I did was base the humans off of Persian culture because that is my husband's background And I'm very proud of him and I think that the Persian culture is really really cool So you will obviously have noticed this if you've read the stolen kingdom in any of the other books And you will see that there's a lot of Persian culture woven into the story even just in little things such as um, gormasabzi is served, which is my husband's favorite food and things like that. Little details like that can make things feel more real in your world, more real to you and to your readers. Another example is how I slip in actual Persian words into the story. Like for example, Hodafis is where Ari lives, but it's actually the way that you say goodbye. And it means something along the lines of God bless you, if I remember right. I'm sorry if that's not perfectly accurate. I did a lot of research and I asked my hubby a lot of questions to make sure that I did that culture justice and I made it as unique and original as possible. And when you're pulling from the real world, you can choose to either let it actually reflect things that line up with what we experience in real life or you can choose to merge it with other things so that it becomes its own completely unique new thing that has never existed before. Another example I'll give you is from the Ginny Key and that's when I brought in the mer or the mermaid culture into the world. That made me think of the Russian culture. And so my hubby and I actually went to a Russian church for a few years when we were first married. And so we have friends who are from Russia and from Belarus. And one of the things that I enjoy about the Russian culture and actually this is true of Persian culture as well is that people are much more upfront and they just say what they mean. They say what they're thinking. They're more bold and brave. And so, not to say that I'm not, but as a Minnesotan, there is such a thing as Minnesota nice. I don't know if you've ever heard that before, but Minnesota nice is a real thing. It is just, it's very much um, passive aggressive sometimes. And it's also, you just don't say what you're thinking. I don't know how else to put it. I don't know why exactly. I know that specifically in my family, we have kind of a Scandinavian background. And so <laughs> there could be some culture aspects to that for sure. Um, but I really thought that that fit Rena's personality 
perfectly and so I decided to base her culture off of Russian culture, mostly. So for example, her name, I actually have to look it up in the back in the glossary. This is a name that I actually found on the internet. It is Marina Yuryevna Nezich. And so I thought that was a really cool sounding name. And when I pull from a culture, I think it's really important to pull from all kinds of things. So I wanted to pull from the way that people interact, for example, like I mentioned, and I also want to pull from how they react to the world and how they see the world. And that needs to be different depending on, well, actually that should be different for all characters because every character is unique, but also it's going to come down to just simple things like how you name things. All right. So to review, we have number one, pulling inspiration from images, from visuals that you can actually describe better once you see them. Number two, pulling inspiration from stories and from history uh, or from the world in general and cultures. And yeah, that feels like a very broad topic that I probably could have broken up into smaller topics, but there you go. That is the best that I can do. And then the third thing, and bear with me because this is going to sound really simple, but it's actually, I think, something that not many of us actually consider as seriously as we should. And that is to pull inspiration from your own unique story. And I say this again, very seriously. Most of us are like, yeah, whatever. Because to us, what we know, our own life experiences and our own particular unique background does not feel unique to us because we're like, this is how it is. I'm used to it. It's boring, but you have something that nobody else in the world has. You have a unique blend of your upbringing, your life experiences, your perspective on the world and your unique, just everything about you that nobody else has. And I think a lot of people do not realize just how valuable this is. So to give you an example from, again, my story from the Stolen Kingdom in particular, I wanted to share how Ari came to be. Her father is in the human world, as you'll find out right away when you first start reading the story. And so she is therefore Persian, right? She has the Persian background, but this is the tiniest, tiniest little spoiler through chapter two. I had looked it up. It's not that far into the book, but if you want to, you can skip ahead to this point right here so you don't hear a spoiler. Uh, but she is also going to find out that her mother is from Jin. And I didn't explain Jin at all, and I don't feel like going back. So I'm just going to really briefly summarize that I based Jin on the Hebrew culture and maybe a little bit also on the Wonder Woman movie and the style that they have there, which I think is more the Greek gods and goddesses. So kind of that time period. I don't know if I'm blend. I'm blending a little bit. Yeah, for sure. But anyway, the point is that I also really wanted them to have an otherworldly quality because they are supernatural creatures. And so I didn't want to copy Disney because that's a no, no. Uh, but I did like the idea of having a skin color that we don't have. And so I liked how in the movie they had blue skin. And so I thought, you know, if you are pale enough and like I am, <laughs> you can actually see like the blue veins underneath the skin. And so I made it so that the Ginny all have this blue tint to their skin. And so it's a fun, more subtle way of saying that they don't look like humans. They are not quite human. Now bringing it back to my point, which is that Ari finds out that she has a Jin mother. So she finds out that she essentially has um, an intercultural heritage, a Persian father and a Jinny or white mother. I have a lot of reasons for doing this. One of them being that I love intercultural marriage. I am in an intercultural marriage myself, being married to a Persian dude. But I also picture that someday, I hope my husband and I will have kids and I picture having a daughter someday who looks like Ari. will be like, mom, aren't there any books that represent me? Aren't there any books out there that are about someone like me? And I can be like, yes, there is right here. I'm using my own unique story, my life experiences, my background, and the things that have shaped me to create something that's very unique that I don't think I've seen anywhere else. But at the same time, it's a retelling of a story that you have seen somewhere else. So another great example of that, some of my favorite books are these two here by Nicola Yoon, Everything, Everything, and then The Sun is Also a Star. This author also has an intercultural marriage, and so she's brought her own unique take to these stories, and they're both completely different, but they're so unique in the way that she brings her own life experiences into play and actually shares from her personal experience. Highly recommend these. And I think it's really important to touch on something that might offend some of you. I hope not. I hope that you'll hear me out and that 
you know that it's okay if you disagree with me. I'm actually totally okay with that. I think that we need more discussions where people realize it's okay to disagree and to calmly, respectfully disagree. So as long as you are respectful in the comments, I am totally okay with you disagreeing with me on this. This is just my personal perspective. But I know that there is a lot of stuff going on in the author community where people are saying you're not allowed to write something that you are not. So I supposedly should not be allowed to write a Persian character. And so I just want to call this out as absolute garbage. Hear me out. I understand where this is coming from. I think it originally came from a good place where it was that things were not being described well. People were not being portrayed correctly. That I understand. But honestly, how on earth are you going to only narrow down your viewpoint to just you and still tell a good story? Am I only going to tell a story about white women who are age 32? Absolutely not. I wanna include diversity of all things in my story, not just skin colors, but also age and religion and gender and you name it. Like I think that it's really important to have an actual picture of the real world and not to just tell something from a very narrow point of view. In fact, I think it's actually impossible possible to tell a story if you truly followed this rule of only writing what you know it would be impossible to tell a story like that and so let me just kind of explain further really quick going back to how originally i think it was a good idea because like just to use another example that's not race there are a lot of jokes about how men write women really really poorly <laughs> i personally read mostly ya so i don't see this as much as i think you would see in adult literature but i have heard stories about how men write women constantly wearing high heels and these ridiculous dresses their figures are totally impossible um, the things that they do totally impossible they don't understand how to write a period they don't understand how women's bodies work and all that jazz so just to use that as an example I don't think that means that men should stop writing women <laughs> I think what that means is that you need to actually do your research learn about something that's not you, learn about this new perspective that you don't have on the world and make sure that you portray it accurately and well to the best of your ability. So for example, when it came to writing Ari in the Stolen Kingdom and the Persian culture, I did my absolute best to make sure that I did that culture justice. And I did that by asking my husband a million and one questions. And I did so much research. I Googled everything. I re-Googled everything. I would listen to YouTube videos to make sure that I had the correct pronunciation and try to figure it out and get it as accurate as I possibly could. And so I think that's really, really important if you're going to portray something that is not from your perspective, it doesn't mean that you can't do that because again, a story with only one perspective and nothing else is going to be the worst story ever. It's going to be so boring to read, so not interesting to anybody because we want to learn about things outside of us. We want to read about things outside of us and explore the world in that way. So again, this is my very strong opinion, but it's okay if you disagree with me, is that we need to have more diversity in stories of all things. We need to have more people portrayed and to see more perspectives and experiences outside of our own. And I don't think that's a bad thing. But like I said, it originally did come from an important good place where people were portraying things wrong and probably still are. They might be portraying cultures or races or religions or age groups or genders or whatever, you name it. They might be portraying something wrong. And so that is where the frustration I think really lies. And instead of saying, don't do it at all, like that's the worst advice ever. I hate that advice. Instead of saying that, we need to instead encourage people to start writing it well, to do their absolute best of their ability to do it justice, to get what they call the word sensitivity readers who have that experience and that perspective to run it by them and say, Hey, is this accurate? Bringing it back to the um, men, male authors writing women poorly. A really easy example would be for a man to ask a woman like, Hey, would you do this? And you could ask a group of women like, Hey, um, so like, do you get your period like all month or do you like, you know, <laughs> and ask questions and then those people can help you to portray something more accurately. Like, Hey dude, no, I actually don't wear heels 24 seven because my feet would be lame. <laughs> but essentially what I'm trying to say is that we need to make an effort to write it well and we need to make an effort to get 
the perspectives that we don't have and to make sure that we're portraying them well and accurately. But I firmly believe that they should be portrayed. All that to say, I know and expect that there are gonna be people who disagree with me and I'm totally okay with that. And I would love to hear your side of it. I've pretty much said all of my side, so I'm not going to probably do any lengthy discussions in the comments, but I am totally open and I welcome you to share your opinion below and your thoughts on this because I'd like to know. And as long as it's respectful and kind, I am happy to have that. Just know that if there are any trolls out there who decide to be nasty, this is still my space and I'm still gonna say absolutely not. You don't get to treat people or me that way. And also, I'm just gonna call it right out. There is sort of a cancel culture going on right now. And so again, the nice thing about self-publishing is that if you anyone out there wants to try to cancel me I would say good luck with that because there's nobody telling me to stop I'm going to continue to proudly publish my books and be excited about having something that's going to represent my daughter someday and I think that's awesome I am just honestly so sick of this cancel culture I can't tell you how frustrated it makes me that people are giving in. I am not the type of person who will sit down and roll over. I will fight for myself and I will stand up for myself. And I encourage the rest of you to do the same because I don't think that it's right to say there's only one way to do something. There are millions of people in this world. We are all incredibly unique individuals. And I think that it's really important to know that it's okay to disagree. It's not the end of the world if you disagree with somebody. Ugh, I don't know if I'll include any of this, but I need to wrap it up. Subscribe if you haven't already so that we can hang out again in the future, and I will talk to you again very soon. Bye. You've got a little bit of blurry there. You okay? How's that? Is it better? Okay, cool. No, it's not better. Can you see me now? <laughs> okay.